I'm here with Dr. Ted Polglaze, and it's a real pleasure to have someone who has such vast uh, experience, both as an, a competitor and as an academic, as a sports scientist. Uh, Dr. Polglaze competed in the bobsled, the four-man event, in the Nagano Winter Olympics in 1998. Uh, he has coached and worked in elite sport for over 20 years as a sport medicine provider, as um, a sport um, scientist, and uh, he's worked with a variety of athletes in different sports. And so he's ideally positioned to talk a little bit about the uh, psychological and physical aspects of injury and some of the difficulties entailed in the injury experience. So thank you for being part of the, the interview. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Maybe you can talk a little bit more and just elaborate on your athletic background and, and your background as a sports scientist and sport medicine provider. Yeah, for sure. So, and I like to think the two are in parallel and, and the two of them really kind of, you know, my sports science background helped with my sport and my sport definitely helped with my sports science ability to, you know, do the job. But yeah, so, I mean, I was, as a kid, I always loved sport and tried lots of different sports. I was always a fast runner. And so sprinting was, was what I was concentrating on. And I became aware that bobsled was a sport that looked for sprinters. So I thought I'll give that a go which is quite uncommon for people in Australia and particularly Western Australia, which is mostly renowned for its beaches. But anyway, I, I, I made the team and I was in the team for um, seven years through the 1990s, culminating in yeah, competing in the format at Nagano, which was, you know, yeah, it was, it was uh, yeah, from a sporting point of view, it was an absolute highlight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, then from a, from a professional point of view, so, uh, when I was finishing my honours degree, uh, in, in actual fact, while I was doing my honours um, year, I commenced work at the WA Institute of Sport in 1989 as a sports scientist and physiologist. And um, I mean, whilst I was still doing bobsleigh, I only worked part time, but still, still pretty full on through the 90s um, uh, at WACE. And then after WACE, I've kind of moved around. So once I retired from bobsleigh in 98, worked at a few different institutes around Australia, Tasmanian, New South Wales, back to WA, and then also with, uh, uh, with the Australian Institute of Sport. Uh, so I've worked, one of the things I love about sports science, you work with heaps of different sports. So everything from archery to equestrian, to rowing, to hockey. Uh, so I've mainly worked with team sports, worked with national teams in hockey, water polo and lacrosse, but also national rowing team. Um, yeah, and then I, I did all that until about 2014 when I went back to uh, uni full time to do my PhD in in you know sports physiology and analysis. So um, so yeah, I've I've, uh, I've certainly worked with lots and lots of athletes in lots of different sports, and unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, you know, I had to deal with injuries, but but um, you know, really, it's just part of the process of getting of achieving your goals. And, and one of the things I've found too is it's you know the process of dealing with an injury is there's a lot more in common than there is difference whether you're an archer or a roller and whether you're a junior athlete or a you know world champion so yeah lots of observations and and experiences to learn from yeah. and, and it well, I, um, I had some pretty major injuries in the lead up to my final year trying to qualify for the olympics and i learned so much about myself i learned so much about training and i learned so much about the process um, by having to get through that challenge. Mm. Yeah, you've touched on great points and I want to come back to a number of those things in terms of uh, elements that you've learned uh, from your personal experience. And it sounds like you have just a wealth of experience and knowledge having worked with athletes across different sports. You also mentioned uh, that it was kind of unusual for someone from a warm weather climate like Perth, Australia, to initiate uh, or to partake in bobsled. How did that come about? So it was actually watching the Calgary Olympics in 1988, which was the first time that Australia competed in those um, uh, in, in the bobsleigh event. So it was the first time that they really showed bobsleigh in any detail on the games coverage. 
And I, I remember watching it because it was February in Perth, so it was summer, 38, 40 degrees. And they were showing the Australian team and, um, um, you know, mentioning that these guys had come from an athletics background, sprinters or long jumpers or whatever. And I was a sprinter at the time. And I can remember saying to my best mate, who was sitting there watching, I said, oh, well, I'm going to try it for the Bob's A team. And he, he, you know, he cracked up laughing. He thought, you know, how ridiculous, like someone from Perth, you know, doing Bob's A. But the, the thing is, even, you know, teams like the Canadians and the Americans and, um, you know, the Germans and all that, they're not necessarily guys that grow up in ski resorts or mountains or whatever. They're, they're guys who come from a, you know, a power sport background. So, right. um, yeah, so it was, uh, uh, you know, all the bobsledders we were kind of like, um, uh, whether we were Canadians or Australians or wherever, we were, um, um, yeah, we, we had a similar background sporting wise and we also weren't necessarily skiers or, you know, winter people kind of thing. Right, right. So it's sort of a, a summer sport transported into maybe a winter environment. Indeed, indeed, yeah. yeah. And, we used and to say bobsleigh was a real poaching sport because it was like, you, know, you, you don't grow up as a young kid doing bobsleigh. You, you graduate to bobsleigh from other sports. So, yeah, it was one of them. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you had a number of injuries yourself as an athlete. Maybe you can talk about some of those injuries and what they were. Yeah, so primarily hamstrings. Um, uh, I think the first time I ever popped a hammy was in uh, the year nine school athletics carnival, just coming um, onto the straight after 300 metres, way out in front, but um, blew a hamstring, collapsed in a heat, had no idea what was, you know, what was going on. I didn't, didn't even know the word hamstrings back then. I think I was 13 or 14. Um, um, obviously, I couldn't finish the race. Later in the day, there was 100, and I was, you know, the favourite for that one to go in it. I asked the phys ed teacher, and he said, yeah, yeah, give it a try. I came out of the blocks and took about three strides and completely obliterated my hamstring. Mm -hmm. So that was my first exposure to it. Um, I, I mean, every now and then I had hamstring strains through my sprinting and bobsleigh career, but towards the end, uh, the last year and a half, I think I, well, in, in actual fact, in the last, um, what, probably four months leading into final Olympic selection, which for me, I just missed out on the Olympics before and decided, right, I'll, I'll give it, you know, one more crack another four years. And I was in excellent shape, but um, uh, yeah, uh, three and a half, four months out from the final selection trials, I blew my hamstring, it was a pretty major one. And actually kind of, you know, re, re kind of strained it two other times through that rehab. Um, but at that time, I actually came across a physio who had a different way of going about things than all the other physios that I had before. And, and, and nothing against those physios, they were just, um, you know, passing on what at that stage was best practice. But they kept telling me that I needed to get stronger. And I, I was really, really strong. I was probably one of the strongest people in the gym that I trained at. Um, I was very diligent and, you know, made the most of every rep and things like that. But that was actually the problem. I was too strong and I wasn't balanced. And this physio, he never, ever, ever plugged me into a machine. All he ever did was get me to do different movements and get me to kind of, um, he, had his, he would have his finger on my lower back or my hamstring or my glute or whatever, and he'd get me to try and feel the same thing that he was feeling and to understand. And he taught me to... I like to use the word listen. He taught me to listen to my body and understand how to use it properly. And I actually wish, you know, in the end, he, he got me right just before the trials. And obviously, I was, I was lucky enough to make the team and we went on and qualified. But I kind of wish I had gone through that process a year before because then with an extra year of training, I reckon I could have been, you know, the, the most powerful ballistic explosive athlete that, that was that I could possibly be if I had have had that knowledge that I learned from that injury. Yeah. So just to clarify, you had an, a major hamstring tear months before the Olympic selection. And despite that, you still made the team and went on to compete in the Olympics. Still made the team. And, and essentially what it, what it meant when I blew my hamstring, I had to go from doing, you know, I was probably doing three sprint sessions a week, one push session, you know, we had a, a push sled and probably three, maybe four weight sessions. Literally, I went back to the only exercise I could do was to lie on the floor 
um, uh, on my stomach and just contract my uh, glute and make sure that my back was relaxed. And that was my training for probably, probably about two weeks. That's literally all I did. I had to, um, anything that was kind of like um, reinforcing my old movement pattern, we had to avoid. So, um, so for two weeks, it was just stop absolutely everything. And, and this was obviously a leap of faith on my part um, uh, from the physio, but also it was like, it was desperate measures and, you know, the other physios I've had in the past it hadn't worked kind of thing. So, but literally from three months out, three months before the final selection trials, the only thing I could do was lie on the ground and practice um, contracting my glute and doing it without also kind of like, you know, clenching my lower back muscles and hamstring. And it took diligence and it took very, you know, like fine kind of single focus kind of thing. But you know, he, he convinced me that that's what I needed to do. And if I, if I did that, then I would be able to slowly get back. And I mean, as it turned out, I was only able to get, I think, two sessions on the, on the track before I had to jump on a plane and go to um, the selection trials. And that, that was all nerve wracking. But um, uh, I had confidence that I had worked through the process and in many ways, literally rebuilt myself I'd rebuilt the way I sprinted which which I had to do because the way I sprinted in the past was unsustainable yeah so yeah. In, in that process it it sounds like over the course of that few months you were quite restricted from the sounds of it in in and you had to be very specific or intentional about what you could do and how to kind of retrain your your sprinting technique is that correct or yeah absolutely 100 percent. so um and um and early on there was it was entirely um physio peter o'sullivan his name was he was he's you know one of my greatest heroes in life uh he helped me get where i wanted to go but literally for that first two and a half three weeks everything i did was based on the kind of instructions he gave me and most importantly, the cues that he gave me to understand myself, um, you know. Uh, so um, it wasn't about just doing stuff and giving information to him. It was about me doing it and and my interpretation and my feedback to him. And he guide me along. And you know, for sure, he'd um, you know, I, I, I can't remember. I was probably having physio three times a week, or however often it was. So it was regular visits with him but he would give me feedback on what I was feeling versus what he was feeling and whether I was, you know, still need to get there. But yeah, it was that, it was absolutely that single focus on glute versus lower back contraction and making sure we got that right. So it sounds like this physio was uh, maybe special or unique in, in the types of information, maybe the specificity of the information that he was giving you and helping you to understand what was happening in your body. Um, is, that, is that something that's important or valuable in terms of recovery? Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Oh, I would say it's absolutely vital. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that he never plugged me into a machine or whatever. I think really, in, in terms of this kind of injury, which is like an overuse injury, it's an injury because you're not kind of moving correctly or whatever, then, all the machines and all the different kind of, you know, you can go to a physio and get manipulation and you can get loosened off or whatever, but that doesn't change the way you're going to move next time. And therefore it increases the chances of getting the injury back again. So this kind of functional assessment of how I move and what the, what the detri detrimental aspects of that were and what I had to do to, you know, address those to me, that was the, that was the ideal and it should be the, this should be the, you know, um, minimum kind of standard approach to dealing with that type of injury is mm -hmm. getting the athlete and, and look also, and this is speaking more as a sports scientist and working with a lot of athletes who some have done rehab well and some between the end of their career. Part of that is the ones who embrace that and think, okay, this is what I need to do. This is the next little, little big whatever this is the thing that i need to get right for now and the other things will come along so so yeah it's 
you know, it's not a word I use often, but I suppose it's empowering the athlete that, you know, ultimately you're the one who has to put it all together. You're the one who has to make sure you've got the right movement pattern, the right, you know, muscle activation, things like that. Mm. One of the things I was going to ask you, Ted, was about the factors that distinguish athletes who seem to make a successful return versus those who are unable to do so. And maybe you can um, talk a little bit more about that. Yep. Yeah, it's a good question because, you know, I mean, there's, there's lots of different athletes I've worked with in lots of different sports who, uh, unfortunately, you know, they have to deal with injury. Some of it do it well, others don't. Some of them do it well for one reason and others for a different reason. Um, uh, but for those who do, and, and uh, uh, as on top of that, there are some athletes who are just lucky and almost never get injured, and I'm very envious of those people. Mm. But for those who do face injury and have to address it, um, that, that's almost the first thing, addressing it, rather than thinking, oh, God, you know, woe is me, I'm getting injured again. Those who say, right, like, what's going on here? What, what do I need to do to stop this happening or to minimise the likelihood of this, um, this occurring? So. Um, it's not just diligence. To me, it's a proactive kind of approach to say, right, um, uh, this injury is holding me back or I keep getting this injury, it's recurring. So clearly, the way I'm going about things is not quite right. Um, it might work for everyone else, but it's not working for me. So what do I have to do to just kind of, I suppose, customise my approach to training? Um, uh, to do that, and the other thing I'd say too is, uh, a lot of the top level athletes, whether it's injury or whether it's you know particular skill development or whatever, they take charge of their their mission. And I like to say this, and it's interesting because I've said this to it to um, you know different people involved in the, in the elite sports system, and and some people get it and others don't. But I, I like to say that the athlete is the CEO of their campaign. They're the ones who are in charge. Uh, they're the ones who have to kind of take in and filter all the input, all the requirements, all the schedules, all that, and literally put it together on race day or game day or whatever. So, so I think a common trait amongst athletes who really deal well with injury and rehab are those who have that CEO approach that if they're not getting from the doctor or the massage therapist or the um, or the you know, the, the weights coach or whoever, if they're not getting from them what they need, they, they're, you know, they're um, proactive in kind of making sure that they do. So that doesn't necessarily mean saying, oh, you're no good, I don't want you anymore. It's more about just this expectation that we need to make sure we're doing, you know, things as well as we possibly can. Right. So the, the athletes who make effective recoveries seem to be proactive in seeking out the types of support or resources that they need. It also sounds like they're analytical and they make an effort to understand the causes of what led to the injury so that they can either change movement patterns or uh, change what they're doing in order to avoid re-injury or, or further uh, injuries down the road. Yep. Um, and uh, again, it, it sounds like that information piece is, is really important and uh, the communication also between the, the athlete and the practitioner. Um, yep. So yeah, th those are great points and insights. And um, in particular, you know, you're, I have kind of all these bells going off in this kind of sports psychology, you know, world we would talk about sort of the locus of control where an athlete sort of sees themselves as, you know, in control of, of their destiny. And if yeah. they kind of have an internal focus that they believe that the things that they do make a difference to the outcomes. And so it kind of sounds like um, you, you're speaking a little bit, I think, to that point as well. Um, would you say, um, maybe you can talk, and you've alluded to some of this already, but in your experience as a elite competitor and Olympian, as a sports scientist who's worked with many, many athletes, what are some of the challenges associated with injury or recovery from injury? Um, 
Yeah. So one of the challenges that the athlete mainly faces is the doubt, especially when the injury first happens. Like, you know, is this the end of my career? Is this the end of my season? You know, which for me, the end of my season in 1998 or 1997, when I was leading into selection, would have been the end of my career. So initially, the biggest challenge is that doubt. You know, is this going to end me or is this going to, am I going to be able to get back in time for selection or the first competition? Am I going to be able to run the qualifying time? So the biggest challenge initially is that doubt. Um, but then that kind of fit, fits in with what you're saying is it's almost that mindset then that, yeah, you're going to have the doubt, but if you have the mindset to deal with it, um, then, you know, straight away you go from like being, you know, all those, all those kind of things of disbelief and anger and being despondent to the quicker you can turn that around to, okay, what do I need to do and, and put in the process? So that initially there's always that challenge when the injury first happens. Mm -hmm. um, after that, the challenge, I mean, one of the big challenges is the time frame that you have. So you can have a really, really good um, uh, rehab plan in place, but if you don't have the time, like I was lucky if my if my selection trials were three weeks earlier, I wouldn't have been able to rock up. Mm -hmm. So the time frames that you have to deal with, and, and that's literally for an athlete, that's like a, you know, like a pulsing kind of, you know, um, thought in their mind. You know, I've only got six months. I've only got four weeks. I've only got whatever. So, um, so that's a challenge that you have to deal with. Um, um, I think the challenge, you know, I mean, for me, wasn't an issue because we, you know, we weren't professional athletes in any way. But you know, for some athletes, it's their it's their livelihood and their income. So there's all these extraneous factors which directly influence, you know, how you're living. But you have to deal with them somehow, and and sometimes dealing with them is to say, well, if I take care of this most important thing for now, these other things will, you know, take care of themselves later, kind of thing. But it's easy to say that, you know, when it's not affecting your income for others, it, it can be a real challenge. So I suppose there's all these external factors. But then, yeah, to me, the other challenge is, uh, I mean, this is a phrase I use often now with athletes in rehab. One of the, one of the hardest things is um, I, I like to use the analogy of kind of how close you can get to the edge of a cliff. So when you're doing a rehab, you have to be, you have to, I don't want to use, I wouldn't say conservative, but you have to be smart in how much you progress and advance your, you know, your loads. And you never know whether you've done too much until you fall off the edge of the cliff. So it's like, you know, just edging forward, getting your toes a little bit closer. And, you know, you, especially if you're on a limited time frame, you want to try and expedite the process, right. but you don't right. want to fast track it. And that, that's a problem too, is some people try and fast track it. You want to do it as fast as you possibly can properly, but you never know how fast that is almost until you've gone too fast kind of thing. So that is, and that's as a, I would say, a, you know, a service provider working with athletes, that's part of the, let's say, craft of, you know, um, trying to monitor and and give it your best guess as to, how much of a step up can we take this week? I don't think. Yeah. So yeah. And so I think that's a really interesting distinction, you know, that you mentioned about kind of, um, I, I liked how you phrased it about kind of pushing, um, expediting, but, but not sort of progressing so quickly that you fall over the cliff and yep. that in your role as a sports scientist and physiologist, um, you're, trying to help that the athlete walk that fine line between doing what they can, but not pushing it too far where they maybe do further damage or ultimately set themselves back further. Exactly. Um, I, I also thought it was really interesting. You mentioned that, you know, some athletes and initially when there's that uncertainty about the implications of the injury and what it might mean for their career or their progression, that uh, there can be despondency and disbelief and that some athletes are able to kind of turn that around quicker and kind of refocus and in your experience i'm wondering what what do you see or what do you attribute those differences to like why are some athletes able to maybe turn a switch kind of where they're like okay this has happened but now i'm going to move forward and get on the business of 
you know, this is my new competition, whereas others remain more despondent? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. And as you're asking that, I was kind of ticking through my mind and thinking, you know, how am I going to answer this? But I think probably the, the first thing is, I think every single athlete goes through that, that first thing of, oh, why did this happen? Well, was me. But the good athletes might go through it for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, or a day and others might go through it for the rest of their career kind of thing so i think the biggest thing that separates those who grab hold of it and, and get rid of that despondency really quickly i think the biggest thing is ownership they take ownership of their their sporting career right. and their campaign and and they quickly get past the what what you know, what can I not do and move on to what can I do? Mm -hmm. and what do I need to do now to progress me back towards doing all the things that I need to be able to do? So, yeah, it, it's like, you know, the can-do attitude. Okay, what, and this is interesting for me as, as an athlete who dealt with a lot of injuries and, um, uh, but also as a sports scientist, physiologist who's designing training programs and training loads and progressions, and you often get told all the things that you can't do. So straight away, I'm thinking, okay, well, that means we can do this or we can do that. And so probably in, in service team meetings with other professionals, you know, I'm always the guy saying, yeah, well, okay, well, does that mean we can do this? Or, you know, it's like there's this long list and yet you almost need to see clarification. And in a way, you're almost finding out where that boundary is between can and can't. And I think for an athlete, knowing that and, and having that mindset to say okay what is it that i can do now to get me better that's i would say that's the biggest thing that separates successful rehab rehab athletes from those who don't quite get through it yeah so again kind of that ownership piece the uh, approach or the mindset of focusing on the things that one can be working on or improving or um yeah just addressing i guess um, would you say that that is a general quality that transcends injury or that, that athletes like that you would notice kind of irrespective of whether the athlete is injured or is it maybe something that's more injury specific and, you know, the athlete that doesn't necessarily take ownership generally than with the case of injury sometimes does? Yeah, I would say that some, sometimes it's injury that actually sparks that kind of inner, you know, um, realisation that you need to take control. I think there's plenty of athletes that take control of everything they do. Um, and, and, and taking control doesn't mean, you know, like you're a dictator. Um, it, it's taking control might mean finding the right people um, and, and taking their advice. Um, so there are some athletes who, when they're playing really, really well and they're uninjured, they've still got that taking control ownership and they're, you know, they're making sure the coach is telling them what they need to do to work on their, you know, their blade entry if they're a roller or their, you know, their, their, their kind of reverse trap if they're a hockey player or whatever. So they're, they're, they're already in that process of taking control um, and it might be skill or fitness or whatever. And then all of a sudden the next thing they need to take control of is rehab. But then there are others, like I say, that they don't realise um, that they really they, they kind of just go along with the flow, but then when you're injured, all of a sudden it's just you. You know, the rest of the team are out. You know, throwing long pieces or playing hockey matches or you know whatever it might be, and just you. You know, you can't do the same as them. So it's I suppose it's like a fork in the road. Okay, yeah, this is the chance to take control and and understand myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I need to do. Um, you you touched on this point, but I want to just come back to it. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about some of the uncertainties related to recovery from injury. And I know you mentioned like uncertainty about the impact of the injury on one's career. Are, are there other common uncertainties that you see in, in the athletes you work with or that you experienced? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think one of the uncertainties is, you know, whether you're going too quickly or too slowly with your rehab, um, you know, and because again, you, you never really know until, until you know it's too much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some athletes want to push it a little bit and others are a bit more cautious. And certainly I'd say athletes who are, um, who perhaps have had a, you know, recurring injury over a no number of years, they'll be more cautious, but 
but hopefully they'll also be more wise, I suppose, as to what things they need to do. Um, so that kind of doubt about the pace and the, the type of, you know, return to play or, or rehab that you're going through. Um, um, I, I think, I, I think uh, I, I can only speak for me personally with my injury um, kind of um, process, but I, I think it's something I've probably observed in other athletes as well. But certainly that, that kind of lack of confidence um, that sometimes even though you take this can-do attitude and, and this, this, you know, ownership kind of approach, there's still, you know, you're still questioning yourself and then you start questioning whether your body's actually up to it. Um, but in a way, and, and again, you know, these, these thoughts can creep into your mind and they can overtake you or they can actually be a catalyst to, because the lack of confidence then becomes like a question, okay, well, well, you know, am I actually up to this? Yes, I think I am. I just need to keep doing this or whatever. So, so the confidence or the lack of confidence doesn't need to be a negative. It can be a, I suppose, a spur to either reinforce that what you're doing is the right way or to perhaps question and think, no, maybe I need to have a bit of more think about this or chat with my physio or whatever and, and go about it. But the confidence can certainly sometimes get you down a bit but you know, if you're smart enough to, to I suppose, listen to it, then yeah. it can be. Yeah. So uh, a lack of confidence sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative or deleterious thing, but can uh, spur or initiate maybe further self-analysis or, um, again, kind of reflection on what one's maybe doing well and needs to continue doing, or conversely needs to change. Sounds like. Yeah, great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the types of pain that athletes experience. And and when I say pain, I suppose I mean in the broadest sense, maybe physically or psychologically. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, you know, with, with some injuries, and I was fortunate, I all my injuries were overuse injuries. I never had a, um, you know, like, playing a hockey game and collapsing and, and rupturing an ACL or anything like that. I, I never had an injury like that. Although um, I, I honestly don't know how my knees got through the last two and a half years of, of my career. Mm. And I'm thankful that they did, but I, I know the pain of tearing a hamstring when you're running at full speed. Um, it's a very, you know, it, it physically hurts a lot, but the devastation, um, especially when you're in good nick and you're heading towards, you know, you like say I missed out on, on the 9014 um, by not much and I decided to give it one more go and it was so close and, and that absolute devastation that, oh, like this could be it, this could be the end of my campaign, my career and everything. So, so the, the, the psychological and mental pain with that is, you know, um, is really hard to deal with. Um, but again, it's like, how quickly do you turn it around? Yeah. But also, I think the pain too of seeing your teammates and seeing, you know, um, other people still being able to go about the things that they really like and and um, you having to lie down in the lounge room and just contract your glute kind of thing. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I remember an athlete that I worked with, in, she was a hockey player. And um, uh, all she could do was kayaking. Um, she could sit on a kayak ergo. Uh, and this was literally 10 years after I went through my process. So she was getting ready for the Beijing Olympics. And, you know, she, she had had a knee uh, reconstruction. It's probably a second or third or whatever. Of course, she ended up making it back because she had this approach that, you know, um, even though I'm not a kayaker and I don't really like sitting on a kayak ergo, you know, physiology lab this is what I have to do for now kind of thing but nevertheless you know she would have loved to have been out there hitting the ball around with her teammates so that uh, I think and again it gets back to the way you approach it that pain of missing out can be the spur to make sure that you you know contract your glute properly or or do what you need to do on the kayak ergo because that will get you back to what, what you want to be doing kind of thing yeah. but certainly the I suppose the um uh, well, the isolation and the, the the not being able to do what you want to do 
having to deal with that, you know, particularly when you don't know how long it's going to last for, that, that is a hard mm -hmm. part of rehab. Yeah. So again, kind of the uncertainty of how long something might last and can take a psychological toll in addition to the isolation. I'm curious what happened in terms of your 90, 90, 1994 experience where you missed out on the Olympics. Maybe, do you mind? Yeah. So, so, so I, I first made the team in 1991. So it was the 91-92 season, which culminated with the Elwoodville Olympics. And and uh, Australia only qualified a two-man for that. I was kind of like on standby. Um, but that was my first year in the team. So so not making the Olympics in Elberville was no big deal for me because I knew that that was when they switched from, um, you know, the Winter Olympics being the same year as the summer to being halfway through. So it meant there was only two years until Willie Hammer. So that was fine. Um, um, you know, it's like, yeah, my first year in, we're close to qualifying, give another two years and I'll be there. Interestingly, the the two, oh, sorry, the 1992-93 season was a bad year for me. I had I didn't tear my hamstring, but I had continual hamstring strain, and uh, and didn't actually compete in many races. Like you know, we had a squad of five, so there was always one that missed out, and invariably it was me. Um, so I toured, but I hardly raced in the in the 92-93 season. 93. I was in awesome shape. I was the fastest guy on the team. We had all the trials. Um, uh, um, and no matter what combination, if it had me in, it was it was the quickest combination. So so I um, I wanted to make myself the first pick. Um, but I think partly because of the year before where I'd had a bad year with injury and also for a few, you know, kind of unclear kind of selection paths and favoritism and all that. Um, I was the guy who went home and the other guys stayed and competed in the Olympics. So so I literally was the fastest guy on the team, but I was watching on telly kind of thing. So that was pretty painful. As a matter of fact, that was probably the most painful thing that I went through and in a way kind of stilled my resolve so that I was going to do that glute contraction absolutely the way it needed to be done because that's what I had to do to get my goal. So. So yeah, so so missing out in in '94 was was absolutely devastating for me because I was in the best shape of my life and I should have been there kind of thing. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, the next four years, I you know I just made sure I didn't put a foot wrong. I think I was always someone who was a diligent trainer anyway, and made the most of the limited um, athletic ability that I had. I had some, but not heaps. But I wasn't going to waste any of it. Um, but yeah, the, the challenge with that injury came along and, and I mean, honestly, I, I cried when I first tore my hamstring, I was, I thought it was the end and, you know, I'd put my life on hold. I'd sacrificed my career, all these different things, um, uh, because I wanted to give it one last shot and three months out from the trials, I, I honestly thought, you know, that was it, but I was able to turn it around and I had some luck because, um, uh, the physios that were part of the team that had been looking had been looking after me got me onto this guy Peter O'Sullivan, and that was the absolute turning point. So, um, yeah. But but the other thing I'd say too is Peter O'Sullivan was a guy who was very hot in high demand, um, and he he wouldn't spend much time with you if you weren't doing what you needed to do. But he allowed me to come three four times a week because he 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 knew that I was doing exactly what was needed to do. So it yeah. was between the two of us. Yeah. Right. So it sounds, I, I can only imagine it must have been a bitter pill to swallow having the injury. Um, and, but it also it sounded like it strengthened your resolve, as you mentioned, to really do the things that you needed to do and to engage in the specific behaviors that helped you eventually come back and, and actually compete in the Olympics. Yep. I just wanted to come back to that point about confidence and a lack of confidence. As a sports scientist, are there things you do or can do to build the athlete's confidence in their physical capabilities, in their you know belief that they'll be able to return at a high level? Um, yeah, what are there confidence building strategies that you employ or would advocate? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big believer, like obviously for someone who's done a sports science degree um, and continued, you know, research and study and all that, I'm, I'm a big believer in the power of knowledge. So um, I really think that part of my job as a sports scientist is to help the athlete understand why they're doing something. And if they understand why they're doing something, then the how becomes just straightforward. However, I also acknowledge that there are some athletes that are absolutely gifted, you know, the, the best hockey player in the world or an amazing, you know, equestrian rider or whatever, and they, they're just good at what they do and they don't want to think about it too much. So um, I think part of the craft of my job is to understand that there are those who want to know the why and that will help them do it better, whereas there are others will, that will get too caught up in the why and... Um, I suppose it's like paralysis analysis, but no, sorry, paralysis by analysis. So they just they just want to they just want to be told, look, do this, um, and you know, and as long as they have faith in you that what you're asking them to do is the right thing, then that's kind of all they all they need. But personally, the way I see the world, I suppose, is that yeah, if, if you understand the why, then the what becomes quite easy, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I like to. And I suppose it's at different levels. There, there are some athletes who are very, very analytical and want to know all the information. There, there are some athletes who are too analytical and want to overthink it too much. Um, but yeah, it, it's I suppose it's understanding that balance of making sure they understand, um, you know, enough information to appreciate that yeah, this is what I need to be doing. Right. So yeah. it, it sounds like you're probably giving a, a lot of rationales for um and information education about kind of here's why we're doing this and and here's the benefit or and and then would you say when the athlete gets that 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 has an impact in some way on their behaviors or their compliance with with the protocol yeah like i would i would certainly hope so and, and i would certainly certainly i would say that you know over the years i've kind of learned to read it and understand which ones really thrive off that um, rationale versus those who it becomes a bit of a diversion or a distraction mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. but, but certainly, uh, you know, for those who I, who I think really thrive on that kind of information, it's not as though I give them textbooks or lectures or graphs or anything like that, although some, some really, really love that kind of information, but I always try and relate um, what the concept is to where they're at now and what they need to do in terms of playing water polo or hockey or, you know, whatever it might be. Right. So kind of bridging the abstract to something concrete in terms of where they want to be or what they want to be able to perform in terms of their sport and their skills has value yeah. or benefit. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You also talked and have referred to, uh, throughout our conversation to that point about time frames and and you know time being at the forefront of the athlete's mind and you know the competition is you know so many weeks or um, so many months away and kind of that question of whether they'll be able to return in time for yeah. you know whatever event um i'm curious to know your thoughts about um shifting from a focus on time to that of meeting certain criteria before the athlete returns. And that is a really, really important aspect of rehabilitation, which I think I've learned more so from my role as a sports scientist and in, you know, designing and overseeing rehab programs than perhaps I understood in my own time as an athlete. I like to think of it as kind of like two time scales. One is the forward from where you are now, what are the things that you need to progress through to get back to be able to playing your sport unrestricted? And they're not necessarily time-based, they're more like, say, movement quality-based. Like, you know, can I, can I move my thigh through a full, my knee through a full range of motion without getting any pain? Okay, good, that's when I can move to the next uh, uh, stage. And, you know, on average, that stage might take four weeks, but for some people it takes two and a half and for others it takes seven. And it's important to have that patience to not try and fast track the process like we said before. So you've kind of got this, this kind of forward looking schedule, which is more, 
you know, um, yeah, functional movement based, but then you've also got this backward movement, backward moving schedule from the competition, how many weeks to go or the selection trial or, you know, whatever it might be. And um, certainly when I design rehab programs, I, I literally in my mind think of where we're at now and, and what the steps are that we need to get through functionally to progress to unrestricted, you know, return to play versus what's the time ticking backwards as to, you know, when is the selection trial, when when does the team depart, all of those kinds of things. So it's, it's almost like marrying those two schedules um, from different starting points and with different benchmarks, I suppose, along the way. Right. What happens in the event that those two benchmarks don't mesh? They don't coincide or they're unable to marry, I guess, for lack of a better analogy or expression. That's where it can lead to a very, very difficult uh, conversation and a very, very difficult decision. Sometimes, sometimes you have to sit down with an athlete and say, we haven't got enough time. Like this is, you know, we're, we're not, you're not going to be able to get back. Um, we just don't have time on our hands. And I've certainly had to be in rooms where we have that conversation with an athlete and it's, it's absolutely devastating. And, and one of the things for me is I'm always seeing it from the athlete's point of view and thinking, you know, that could have been me in 1997 kind of thing. So sometimes it is, it's the horrible realisation that, um, yeah, the, the schedules don't marry up and you, you're going to miss out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's there's a plan B where you can go about um, um, the rehab process or the treatment, injury treatment or whatever, a little bit differently and take a short-term um, approach, which will mean that they are right for selection and, and you know, competition, but either it could have long-term ramifications for their knee or you know their back or whatever it might be or it could mean that you know um that yeah you take this short-term approach to make sure they get through to the olympics or whatever but then afterwards you, you know you're going to have to take 18 months and just step right back and, and let's build on this injury so that's obviously a better option than saying yeah look it's it's all over kind of thing um, yeah. but yeah so, sometimes that's the reality so given the importance of a competition, there may be times where that rehabilitation or those functional progressions you mentioned are, are modified to get the athlete ready with the understanding that it may have implications for whether they can continue afterwards or kind of, yep. yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. And actually, there's one other one I thought there too, and I, and I can actually think of two different occasions where this has occurred. Has occurred. Sometimes you realise that time is not on your side, but this athlete has such a special role to play within a team that perhaps their training load, and more importantly, their role on game day can be can be customized to just what they can do because you know they're, they're such a special talent so the example i can think of is in hockey field hockey the the drag flickers the ones who go out there when there's it's like a free throw kind of thing with right. such a specialized mm -hmm. skill and if this athlete is so good at that but um um you know can't cope with all the demands of having to run around you know the pitch all day kind of thing then you can tailor the way the rest of the team play and what their role is within the team to suit their their demands. So there's very, I suppose, unique and and, and rare uh, occasions when that kind of comes into play as well. Yeah. But yeah, it's another option sometimes. Yeah, and and it sounds like Ted, there's sort of a this interplay between the time factor and the um, the criteria factor or the ability to meet certain progressions and i thought it was interesting how you said in your mind you're always kind of thinking about those two elements and how they work together and and also you know having been a competitor at the highest level you understand sort of the athlete m mentality and perspective so it's i imagine that informs your sort of approach as well 
Um, massively, absolutely massively. And not, not just in terms of injury rehab, but even in terms of the way you design training programs, the way you warm up, you know, everything, uh, you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, in strength and conditioning now, you see that the, the S&C coach kind of runs the warm up, whereas I'm the complete opposite. Like I say to the athletes, like this is your game. You know, this is your Olympics. You know what you need to do. You tell me what you need to do. And I'll make sure that you kind of, you know, got the right elements in, in you know, in appropriate amounts or whatever. But I'm not going to say to you, run from here to here have this much rest, go from there to there kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, uh, like I say, it's not just injury, it's it's throughout all aspects of being an athlete, I suppose. Sure, sure. Um, what, what are some of the ways I, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking that I imagine your experience helps the athletes have trust in, in you and your recommendations. Uh, you also alluded to the fact earlier that <clears throat> you had seen some different, <clears throat> excuse me, physiotherapists. And it wasn't until you found Peter O'Sullivan or were referred to him that you were really sort of, you know, understood and knew what you had to do. So maybe you can speak to this point about the importance of trust in one's uh, practitioner, their physiotherapist or sports scientist. Yeah, so, um, and interesting for me, I mean, until I met Peter O'Sullivan, I didn't know that there was another way of going about this rehab. So I had faith and trust in the in the physios that, that I had before that. And I did what they asked me to do. And, you know, uh, and, and I don't hold any malice against them for doing the wrong thing. It's just, that was the best practice at the time. But then, again, I was lucky to stumble across this guy who was, literally a world leader in, in what he did. Um, uh, and he's now one of the world leaders in dealing with back pain, minimizing back pain, all that kind of stuff. Um, Cause all my hamstrings were coming from, from bad back mechanics. Um, but yeah, so I suppose there's the, there's the difference between blind faith and for want of a better word, educated faith or informed faith or whatever. So yeah, I think I went from blind faith to, to, being educated but also learning myself along the way that um well this is something that you can take um uh or inquire about and find out what it means for you and make sure that what you're getting from your service providers whether it's the physio or whoever it might be um fits in with with that kind of thing and, and part of it too and, and i think back to a coach i worked with in rowing that um he was a very simple man, but he was a very, very successful coach. And what one of the things that made him so successful is that he knew there were things that he didn't know about rowing, um, but he knew that they were important. So he got people in that kind of, I suppose, covered the gaps that he didn't know. And he didn't know, need to know the, you know, all the fine detail he just needed to know that you were covering the things that he didn't. Um, and that made him a successful coach. And so I think it's getting back to the athlete CEO position. Uh, it's the same kind of thing. You don't necessarily need to know all the stuff that the physio knows, but you need to know that it's fitting in with the overall process and that, um, that they've got it covered and they're going about it as best they can. Kind of thing. Right. So on that note, given the <clears throat> importance of a team approach to recovery, Maybe you can speak about the relevance of communication between the different stakeholders, be it the athlete and the coach or the athlete and the sport medicine uh, provider or um, yep. sport scientist. Yep. yep, absolutely. And look, having sat through, you know, countless meetings on athlete planning, including athlete rehab planning, the the key difference between successful teams and successful outcomes versus non-successful teams or outcomes is the difference between like people staking their turf versus those with a clear common goal so you know i mean i'll just use a made-up name but Billy Ray Valentine. <laughs> That's always the one I use. It's one of my favourite. Yeah. If, if Billy Ray Valentine, my, my son's got to laugh at that. They're like, who's Billy Ray Valentine? But anyway, um, if Billy Ray Valentine is getting this um, 
um, continual hamstring strain for three years, but he's the best in his position in the world and you need him there. What Billy needs is not a few service providers saying, oh yeah, I'm the one who, you know, is the work he did with me um, that made the difference or yet, or, you know, this is my chance. I'm going to stake my claim on Billy Ray Valentine. He doesn't need that. What he needs is people who have a common goal to make sure that he can get back out on the pitch and do what he does. Mm -hmm. So, so this common purpose and this lack of, um, lack of care about credit kind of thing. Um, But, but also (coughs) the other thing I'd say with that too is, is clear understanding of the roles and the expertise that different people have. And it's not, I, I like to think of it as it's like a pie. You know, some people talk about their piece of the pie, whereas I like to think of it as I'm one of the ingredients of the pie. So if there's flour and eggs and water and milk and whatever else you've got, you know, it's the way you all mix together in the recipe that determines the outcome rather than just your little slice kind of thing. Yeah. So teams that have that kind of, um, uh, you know, they don't care about boundaries, that they respect everyone's expertise, but they also uh, respect different perspectives then, but they have a common objective to get Billy Ray back on the field, then they're the teams that work and they're the teams that Billy Ray needs. Yeah. And, and to your, I guess, baking analogy, um, when the ingredients <clears throat> blend together, then, <clears throat> excuse me, as you mentioned or allude to, the, the outcome is good. You know, the cake tastes good, or in this case, the rehabilitation proceeds smoothly and, and the athlete hopefully has positive um, outcomes with function and return to play. Um, exactly. And conversely, if, if you are, you know, if you're the eggs in the recipe and you might be really, really, really good eggs, the best eggs on the market, but if you don't mix well with the flour and the water and the milk, then, you know, the, for that team, you don't quite work kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of understanding that. Mm. So from a treatment provider standpoint, um, and again, you've got lots of experience, I'm sure, having sat in on probably countless meetings and your own personal athlete experience. Um, wh- why is it that or, or what contributes to the team, the sport medicine team working well versus times where it's maybe not as cohesive or maybe where people are more focused on their importance or taking their piece of the pie or credit? Yeah. Um, oh, I think lack of ego is is the key. Mm-hmm. Lack of ego about yourself and understanding that you're there to help, you know, Billy Ray or Mary or whoever. Right, right. Okay. Um, you talked about some of the negative thoughts and and um, emotions that are associated with injury. Do those change over time? Um uh i think potentially yes and i'm thinking about some of my observations with some athletes you know one an olympic gold medalist multiple world champion had to deal with injuries and you know over the years his response was less despondency and more like right well we need to do kind Mm -hmm. of thing so yeah absolutely um Whereas, you know, equally, there are some athletes that over time, it's like, oh, you know, why does this keep happening? And, and, you know, they've been diligent and they've done everything they can. And it's just, you know, it's just unfortunate. Some people are born with a really good chassis and others aren't kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah. And so, yeah. Um, and look, it, within, within hockey, I work with the National Men's Hockey Team. I've seen athletes in both those situations, both very diligent. Unfortunately, had chassis that couldn't cope. And one, it just became too much but the other was like right here we go <laughs> yeah yeah um in terms of expectations what, what are some expectations maybe that athletes have and or maybe you can just speak broadly i guess about the role of expectation in injury recovery yeah i would say the the expectations are that the advice they're being given is the best possible advice um, and, and, you know, not necessarily that all of a sudden, you know, this injured as- athlete has become your focus above and beyond the rest of the team, but that um, more so that, you know, me as an injured athlete, I'm getting 
the appropriate amount of attention and the best advice I need to get back in the team kind of thing. So that to me, yeah, because I saw that on the list of questions and, and I was thinking about that one. Uh, I think that's probably the main expectation. Um, and I think the other one too, actually, is that, yeah, you're working together. Because I can certainly say from my own experience as an athlete, one of the things that really frustrated me was I would get advice from two different people who are part of my team that were contradictory. And I'm like, you guys haven't even spoken to each other because you're telling me A and you're telling me definitely don't do A. So, you know, what's the story kind of thing? Right. So, so I think I think there would be an expectation that there's there's communication and coordination between all the different people involved in in the rehab. Mm -hmm. And in terms of expectations that athletes place on themselves, is that something that you observed or? had conversations with in terms of athletes? Um, uh, yeah, and, and I think it all mixes in together, you know, your mindset, your confidence, all those different things. So I think the expectations for some are that, well, some, they're bulletproof, and this is a chink, and they'll get through it. I mean, others, it can be like, God, I thought I was bulletproof. Like, how did this happen? And, and it might be a major setback for them, which might be something that they never really get back from or might be something that makes them come back stronger kind of thing. Um, but, yeah. Um, uh, sorry, I just lost, lost track of my thoughts. Can, can you just remind me what oh, the... Yeah, sure. So just in terms of athletes' expectations of themselves, whether they yeah. have personal expectations. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, uh, look, I, I think even for the best athletes, it fluctuates. You know, no one's like, yeah, right, you know, I'm going to get through this. This will be easy. It fluctuates and you have periods of doubt and you have periods of absolute certainty that you're going to be right. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, being able to flick those doubts back into certainty kind of quickly. Um, yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, they have expectations. Good athletes who get through the injury they have expectations on themselves that they'll do everything that needs to be done right. well. Yeah. Whereas ones who don't get through it quite so successfully, I think they put expectations on others, but perhaps don't put the same level of expectation on themselves. Mm -hmm. So, and again, um, you know, if, if the athlete, going back to your point about the athlete seeing themselves as the CEO, it sounds like it's important for, or from your standpoint, it's important for the athlete to see themselves as kind of the key driver of their recovery. Would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So on that note, and I think you've kind of alluded to this, but I just want to ask explicitly, what, what's the role of motivation in recovery and return to play? I would say absolutely central and integral. Because if you lack the motivation, you're not going to lie down on, on the carpet in the lounge room and just concentrate on contracting your glute and mm -hmm. kind of making sure you do it right. There has to be some, you know, like it's not as though you grow up thinking, oh, yeah, I want to be a glute contractor when I grow up kind of thing, you know. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem so like the most. You're doing it. Yeah. You're yeah. doing it because it's a step towards something you want to be doing. So there you go. There's right. your motivation. So if you don't have the motivation, you'll quickly walk away from the process. Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's absolutely central. It, right. It's an integral, you know, without it, you, you don't have a return from injury. So is it important then for athletes to know why they're wanting to come back or kind of what they're striving for? Does that facilitate their recovery? Oh, absolutely. And to the point where, and, you know, obviously different athletes go about it in different ways and a sports psychologist is, is really, you know, central in this part is, you know, like for me, it was a reminder of what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to work towards. Um, it, it was never about, oh, you know, I missed out last time, I have to make it this time. It was just, I want to get to these Olympics kind of thing. Um, and so whatever tools you can have, because as I said, there are fluctuations and there's, you know, the periods of doubt are harder to see the way out of than the periods of certainty, you know, um, um, so yeah, any, any tools or cues or processes that you have to remind yourself of the why in terms of the motivation, you know, it, all of a sudden it just makes the, the, you know, doing those little exercises so much easier because you know why, you yeah. know, 
where that's going to take you. Right. So kind of when you're caught in the tedium or monotony of all these repetitious, you know, small little exercises, that understanding and, or, you know, having front and center of what you're coming back to and why you want to do it uh, yeah. sounds imperative. Yeah, um, absolutely. You talked earlier about athletes seeking out and being intentional about getting the types of information or support they need. And I just wanted to briefly revisit that point. Um, wh what are some of the types of support that injured athletes benefit from? Um, I'm, I'm going to go off on a little tangent here and, yeah, and give you a little do. bit more background to myself. So I, I had Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancer, blood cancer. And this was you know, long after I retired. It was 11 years after I retired. And I would say that my experience as an athlete, in particular, missing out on two Olympics before finally making it to a third, actually helped me with my cancer treatment where my first two treatments failed and I was down to you know, some pretty thin options but ultimately succeeded. I can tell you that the very first thing I did after getting the diagnosis uh, from my doctor that unfortunately it was mild cancer at that point, although it ended up becoming you know, quite complicated. But the very first thing I did was organize a meeting with the sports psychologist of the, um, of the men's hockey team who I was working with at the time. And I sat down with him and came up with a mental, a way of mentally approaching this impending scariest thing that's ever happened in my life kind of thing so not to say that it made the process any less um you know scary or anything well well it did make it less scary but um you know the treatment was always going to be what the treatment is but the way i mentally approached it and viewed it and prepared for it meant it was so much easier for me to get through it so literally that was the first thing i did was to um, speak to this sports psychologist, very successful sports psychologist, worked with Olympic gold medalists in multiple sports. And I walked out of that meeting, and, and that was the first of several. I, I, you know, over the course of my first bunch of chemo, I met with him every second week, and it was all calm, and it was all about framing my mental approach to this scary and uncertain period kind of thing. So exactly the same when you get an injury, like just as much as you need the physio treating you and you need the, um, you know, the, the fitness coach um, kind of keeping your fitness up and, and different things like that, uh, it's really important to, to consider the mental perspective of how you're going to get through this. And obviously that's mm -hmm. where the psychologist comes in. They have a crucial role to play. And I would say it's really important to get on top of that early. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe you can talk just a little bit about any elements of, of some of that uh, mental approach that you took that have helped you get through um, the cancer experience. Yeah, okay, so, so look, when I got cancer, I was scared, you know, scared that I wasn't gonna live long and not see my kids grow up and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I was also angry because, you know, I've never smoked, I've lived a healthy life, I've been active, I've done all those things and then cancer comes along and get me. And, and I would be walking around after I got diagnosed, you know, I mean, I had to avoid crowds because I couldn't get, you know, pick up infection like that. But if I was walking around a park or, you know, in shops or whatever, I'd be looking at other people and say, well, how come that person didn't get cancer? Why was it me kind of thing? And the sports psychologist, um, helped me to kind of realize that, you know, none of those thoughts were actually helpful in any way, um, to the point where, where ultimately I, I stopped having those thoughts, whereas early on they were getting the better of me. So that, that was it, it was kind of, you know, uh, and again, this gets back to another sports psychologist when I was a bobsleigh athlete and some, you know, there were certain parts of training that I'd really struggle with. And so he, he taught me to have this stop sign that would come up in my mind and mm -hmm. stop focus on what you need to do, do it kind of thing. Yeah. So it was kind of the same process there is that these thoughts uh, that were counterproductive and virtually, you know, in no one's control, like, you know, cancer doesn't go to the people who live a bad lifestyle. It literally, I mean, you increase your likelihood of getting it, but cancer can literally strike down anyone. 
So it, the, the, the process, I suppose, of recognising which thoughts were just a waste of time, and not only a waste of time, they're actually counterproductive because they led to a lot of more stress and anxiety, recognising that they're just not worth having. Honestly, I got to the point where I almost never had those thoughts anymore. Yeah. So just being aware, you know, I guess nowadays people talk about mindfulness and kind of being aware of those thoughts that are passing into your mind. And in your case, how maybe negative thoughts towards others were less than helpful, or as you mentioned, counterproductive. And sounds like you had some cues to just um, kind of stop yourself when you were, you know, having those thoughts and to shift the focus maybe elsewhere or to, you know, to the point where you mentioned you weren't no longer having some of those negative or counterproductive Absolutely. thoughts. To the point where I think, you know, in, in my training for bobsleigh and with some of the doubts, so, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't as strong in the gym as some of the guys in the bobsleigh team. I was fast and I was powerful, but I wasn't quite as strong. And so, so I, I really struggled with some of the weightlifting tests that we had to do and I had my doubt. So that, that was the thing where I had this stop sign, stop, remind yourself. But I think having gone through that process and that as an athlete, then having sat down with, with a different sports psychologist, but it's a similar principle, you know, 12, 13, however many years later, um, because I'd been through this idea of stop, for the cancer side of things, I almost didn't even need to get to the stop sign it was more like even before you're coming anywhere near the stop sign, recognise that I, you know, drive off in this direction. Kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 It was interesting. Um, and, you know, I imagine that would have implications for injured athletes who are probably having many negative thoughts, uh, you know, or maybe, you know, attributing something either to themselves or, you know, that damn that damn player not run into me I wouldn't be experiencing this or probably a, a predominance of negative thoughts and emotions so it sounds like that strategy might be particularly useful in the case of injured athletes as well absolutely uh, yeah yeah so um we've talked a, about kind of this process of, of functional progressions and I guess when the athlete gets towards the end of a recovery or maybe they're they have an impending competition. Um, how, as a practitioner, or maybe from the athlete perspective, how is it determined that the athlete is ready to go and ready to compete? So, so yeah, it's a good question, and it's a really important part of the process. And again, it's one of those things that it's not definitive. You can't directly measure it. You know, some athlete, and because it's not as though there's this scale of you know uninjured or whatever you know and you might have you know there can be physiotherapy assessments on you know how easily your hamstring moves through a range of motion or whatever but there might be two athletes with the same kind of score on that test and one's fine and the other one's you know gonna pop a hammy so so it i think it's kind of like the the craft i suppose of putting it all together most importantly the ceo um the athlete putting it all together and, and having that confidence and belief that I am ready to go kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not going to say I'm, you know, I've got this magical set of eyes or whatever, but I think having watched lots of athletes and, and in particular the way they move, that's part of my job. You know, you can tell, uh, I like to have, I think I have a little bit of a sense of those who are going about it um, without it hindering them versus those who have that doubt kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, you know, that's that's the kind of feedback I might give to the rest of the service team and sometimes the athlete if I think it's appropriate to say it sometimes it might not be but I think that the at the end of the day and this is nothing too the service team might not think they're ready to go but the athlete says I am I'm ready to fire here and if they're a smart athlete who's done it all right I think I think we should put uh, perhaps we should give more weight to the the athlete's view than perhaps has happened, you know, in the past kind of thing, right. um, because they're the CEO, you know, and again, if they make the call and it's not right, then, well, you know, um, because the flip side is if they say they're ready to go and you say no, and they miss out on that Olympics, you know, that's the rest of their life that they've missed out kind of thing. So, sure. Yeah, Having so said that, um, would, would you say that there are instances where athletes 
desire to get back clouds their judgment about their readiness to do so? Without a doubt, without a doubt, absolutely. And, and this is where, like I say, it's not definitive. It's no one can exactly measure these things and, and know from one individual to the next where it's right. So yeah, without a doubt that um, it, it's a hard call and, and there's, I suppose, it's almost like this recipe with all different amounts and sometimes too much of this and or more of this and less of this is good and you know vice versa is also a good kind of thing so yeah yeah it's a, it's a hard one but but i suppose i suppose what i'm trying to say is that the athlete's perspective should should you know take um uh an appropriate i suppose weighting in the final decision right right and and would you say that that weighting should be like front and center in the or sort of, I don't know, maybe it's hard to assign percentages. Yeah. But. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it should take front and centre, but I, I would say that it shouldn't be discounted, right. particularly for athletes who have a history of demonstrating that they know their body. Yeah. You know? um, conversely, for athletes who have a history of, you know, they have a history of showing that they don't know their body, then their input should only be given kind of minor you know, minor right. consideration. Right. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting how you said you can also kind of see whether the athlete is ready based on their movement patterns. And and I was just kind of thinking a little bit about the interplay between like mind and body. And, you know, that I guess my question is, is if if you sense that from your observation, the movement patterns are appropriate or where they need to be that that coincides with kind of the psychological readiness or um yeah yeah i would, I would that, say it does that's a question i guess yeah no absolutely i would say it does because it's like anything when you know say for an athlete who's who's done an acl and so kind of pivoting or changing direction is a key risk factor kind of thing so, you know, they, they start their rehab, they might be swimming initially or on a bike or whatever, and then with their running, it's all straight line and really, you know, slow initially, and then it gets a little bit quicker. And then you get to this kind of like, you know, fork in the road. Well, yeah, in many ways, that's exactly what it is. You get to the point where you're doing change of direction. And understandably, there's a level of tentativeness with that first change of direction, like, you know, what's going to happen here kind of thing. But, um, you know, over time, and, and that's almost part of the process, is you're building up the, the physical kind of capability of the knee joint to change direction, but you're also building up the belief mentally that you are able to change direction. Yeah. And those two kind of like they're, you know, hand in glove, they go together kind of thing. Sometimes the belief can kind of lead the physical ability. Sometimes the physical ability, the physical ability can be really good feedback and therefore, you know, an improvement in confidence kind of thing. But yeah, those two. Yeah. Um, just a few other questions. And, uh, you know, just as you've been talking, I, so I used to compete in amateur wrestling uh, many years ago and then had three ACL reconstructions, <clears throat> excuse me, and a shoulder operation and a dislocated elbow. And, uh, you know, I was constantly in physio more so than competing. And man, I wish I had the benefit of someone with your expertise. I, mean, I love how you just put things in a very clear and, and um, easily digestible manner. So yeah, I appreciate your, your insights very much. Yeah, um, no worries. Are, would you say, again, I think you've kind of talked to this a little bit, but would you say there are any benefits to having an injury or is it just a negative experience? So and I'm glad you asked this question because if, if there were two words I wanted to kind of get into all my answers to that interviews is feedback and opportunity. So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that there's kind of two types of injuries. There's overuse injury and there's, you know, collision, kind of like catastrophic injury, you know, accident, you know. So the accident one is just something that's going to happen in sport. Like, you know, you take a shot, you miss, you get the rebound. You take a shot, you land, you get an injury. It's just part of the ebbs and flows of, of playing sport. The overuse injuries, first and foremost, they're feedback. They are feedback to the athlete and to the fitness coaches and, and the coach and the medical staff that, okay, so for this athlete, 
we're not quite going about it um, the right way. We need to uh, do things a bit differently, whether that's in the gym or running or, you know, the overall load or all three, you know, whatever. But it's, it's feedback that, um, yeah, uh, what we're doing isn't quite right at the moment. It's too much, too little, wrong timing, whatever. Stemming on from that, injury is opportunity. So even, even now with this COVID pandemic, you know, I'm working with an Australian rules football team. And yes, it's a real hassle that uh, they, they're not playing. They should be in the middle of their season by now, but there's no prospect of it starting. But there is the opportunity to go away and work on the things that you don't normally have time. So in Australian rules football, it's your non-preferred foot and your non-preferred hand. You know, if you can kick the ball off both feet, um, you are all of a sudden so much more of a threat to the opposition. You don't get the opportunity to do that. So it's the same with injury. So you have time away um, from doing all the normal things. So I've watched the best hockey player in history, Jamie Dwyer. I was fortunate enough to be working with the national team when, um, when uh, he was in it. And uh, they number, won a number of World Cups and a couple of Olympic medals. They kind of stumbled at the last um, last hurdle at the Olympics, but nevertheless, Olympic medals and you know number one team in the world by a mile. Jamie Dwyer was a guy who whose chassis wasn't quite built um, uh, for the demands. But so we had to tailor the demands to make sure that he could fit there. In the meantime, never when he was injured. You never, ever, ever saw Jamie without a stick in his hand and a ball on the end of it and working on his touch and control. And, you know, I mean, there's plenty of hockey players that have all these videos of fancy skills and all that. The best in the world is Jamie Dwyer. He's the best player in the world. And he's also the best trick shot guy in the world. So, it, you know, he, and it wasn't just trick shots. He, if, if he couldn't walk, he would work on taking shots sitting down. You know, which happens in a game. He scored goals from lying down on the ground and just reaching out and swinging a shot and scoring a goal kind of thing. You know, so there's the opportunity when you get injured to improve other aspects of your game, of your physical makeup, of your psychological makeup, whatever. So um, it's not it's not the end of the world and woe is me. And it's not just this one thing that you deal with when you're sitting around. There's you know, you can watch video and understand the opposition better. And there's all these things that you can do that mm -hmm. when you're, you know, routinely doing all the training that everyone else is doing. Yeah. You, you may have already answered my last question, but I was going to ask if there's one piece of advice you could give to injured athletes, what would it be? Find the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As a matter of fact, look, I'm, I'm going to say two. What is your body telling you? And find the opportunity in this setback. Mm -hmm. Those two things, all of a sudden, straight away, you've got a task, you've got a couple of tasks to, to focus on. Right, so kind of in terms of what is your body telling you, like it, particularly if it's overuse or repetitive strain, like what information are you getting that you can then use to modify your training yeah. or how you're going about preparing? Yeah. And, and in the case of opportunity, that notion that there are always things that one can be working on or improving as part of their game. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much again, Ted, for your time and, and insights and experience. And yeah, I know any athlete that watches our conversation will undoubtedly benefit from, from the knowledge and expertise that you've shared. So thank you so much. No worries, Liz. It was my pleasure. Good luck with it all.